you are here for a presentation by Applied Geographics titled Content Plus, A New World of Flexibility for Imagery Content Programs. And we have a special guest on the line who I'll be introducing shortly. Before I do that, I just want to welcome everyone. For those of you who are new today, uh, thank you for being here. And for those of you who have been with us in the past on webinars, welcome back. Um, this presentation is part of an ongoing series hosted here at AppGeo where we have the opportunity to interview some of the best and brightest thought leaders in the world of geospatial technology. So to walk you through what we're going to be talking about today, it's going to be a real kind of free form presentation in some ways, but we're going to really be looking at what is going on in the world of imagery and the imagery marketplace and what are some of the big picture trends that we are seeing. And secondly, we're going to be talking about content programs. What are they? How can they benefit you? And how has Hexagon taken it one step further and developed some very interesting approaches to these content programs? And then lastly, we're going to be going deeper into, um, from you know, a statewide perspective, what's tough about making the switch? What are some ways we can get around those challenges and some of the interesting technology that makes it all possible? So a lot to cover, a lot of really cool content for you all today. And just to thank you to everyone who is here today, I made this quick little map of all the states who are in attendance. So if you see yourself there, uh, give yourself a pat on the back for learning something new and being part of our presentation. To give you a quick rundown on who is AppGeo, who is Hexagon, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hexagon at this point, and hopefully you're all familiar with AppGeo. Um, but if you're not, you know we're a geospatial consulting firm based here in Boston, Massachusetts, where I am. We've been at this for about 30 years, so just slightly longer than I've been alive. But um, Hexagon is one of the preeminent providers of imagery in the entire world. And Hexagon has been working with AppGeo since about 2019, where in that partnership, we've had the great pleasure of working with a number of states, a number of agencies. And today you'll be able to learn about what you can do when you combine some of the best data with some of the best folks who can help you implement it into your workflows, into your applications, and into your state or community. So let me begin today by introducing our featured guest, Travis um, Gigliotti from Hexagon. He's currently the director of their technical content solutions as well as their content product manager. So I can't really think of a better person to help lead this discussion here today on what content programs are all about. And he's really maybe one of the best people on the planet when it comes to answering any questions that you're going to have about imagery and streaming imagery content and all the fun technology that goes along with it. So, you know, Travis, thanks again for being here. And before we get started, would you mind telling us a little about yourself and, you know, how you got started working with imagery and also how long you've been with Hexagon? Absolutely, Aaron. Thanks for uh, for having me. It's a tremendous pleasure to be speaking with you today, uh, and the, as well the contingent of of folks interested in AppGeo and, and Hexagon uh, followers out there in the the virtual world. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm the director of technical content solutions uh, and the content programs product manager. These positions really have me situated internally as the interface between our sales, engineering, and production teams, um, as well as having a forward or external facing um, position uh, as the technical contact for the content program. Um, really my role and responsibility is to make certain that our products and offerings are well aligned with our customers' needs uh, while also making certain that our value propositions are being effectively communicated uh, to our customers and, and, the, and the marketplace. Um, I've been with Hexagon for, for under a year um, so, you know, please remember that um, as you pose your, your questions uh, during and at the end of this presentation, you know, remember to give me a couple of softballs in there so that I can knock them out of the park. Um, but as far as my experience and background, you know, it really all began with my first remote sensing course uh, in an internship that I had with the Adirondack Park Agency in, in New York. Uh, after that, I knew I wanted to pursue remote sensing and photogrammetry uh, as a career choice. Um, so over the course of my, my career, I've been extremely 
extremely fortunate to be surrounded by uh, a bunch of great leaders. Uh, and this has allowed me to be involved in a multitude of cool opportunities uh, at all levels of the geospatial marketplace. Um, I, I entered uh, my career sort of formally uh, coordinating an affiliated research center uh, with NASA in Syracuse, New York. Uh, from there, I've taught photogrammetry, GIS, and remote sensing at the university levels. Uh, I worked in defense and aerospace uh, for 10 years uh, in the US. Um, and when I left the US and have moved to where I am located now in Canada, uh, I started and ran my own consulting firm for, for five years until I was plied away by a, a global civil engineering uh, firm, WSP. Uh, and I worked for there over the course of maybe a year and a half uh, doing remote sensing and photogrammetry in the civil engineering sector. Uh, and now I find myself with, you know, one of the premier imagery organizations uh, on the planet. Wow, that's a pretty amazing background. <laughs> Sounds like you got out while you still had the chance, but now you spend quite a bit of time looking down at the U.S. from above. So hopefully uh, if you ever miss it, that's uh, a good reminder of home. Um, and as we were chatting uh, while putting this presentation together, I learned a pretty fascinating fact um, about Travis, and that's that he has um, a pretty important role when it came to the calibration of none other than the James Webb Telescope, which I'm sure many of you have been following for you know the past few weeks or months or even years as this project has excited uh, many of the scientific minded among us. So not to get off topic too much, but like tell us about your role in this project and how you became uh, to be involved because, you know, that's really cool that you had a part in uh, this tremendous um, experiment. Yeah, it is really cool. And it's probably one of the coolest projects uh, I've ever been involved with. Uh, I was the lead photogrammetrist on that program for a while uh, prior to my moving uh, to Canada. And what, what I was essentially tasked with was uh, coming up with a way that we could validate uh, the alignment of, of the optics of the James Webb Space Telescope. As you see uh, in the graphic, uh, there's a tremendous uh, primary mirror, which is the gold surface. And then in front of that, although it's folded up, is the secondary mirror. So light comes in hits the primary mirror, uh, gets shot up to the secondary mirror, which is situated out in front of the primary and then directed down into the science instruments. Well, we needed to, to understand if uh, once it was unfolded from its launch position, if it would be able to achieve uh, the accuracies um, required uh, to provide um, uh, high resolution uh, imagery into you know far, far away galaxies. Um, and so, um, yeah, it was it was my first foray into close range photogrammetry, but you know that led me into a better understanding of of structure from motion when I came to to be more heavily involved in the UAV world and and photogrammetry there. So it was it, no opportunity was lost, um, and and oddly enough, you know it, the the opportunity came through a network connection. Uh, another fellow ASPRS colleague uh, reached out to me to to see if I'd be interested. The interesting fact, though, is you know coming from an aerial photogrammetry perspective where I'm I'm used to to being accurate to a couple of inches or a couple of feet. Uh, my error budget on this project was uh, 25 microns, which is about wow. a quarter width of a of a human hair. So it was it was fun. It was fun while it was there and, and now it's in space and, and hopefully it'll operate uh, the way it was intended. Yeah, well, it's a great legacy to be able to look up and <laughs> uh, imagine that uh, going around our planet. And yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is a man who did not sleep through physics class, as far as I can tell. Um, so we're, we're in the presence of uh, some greatness here. And, you know, let's start out with this. I'd like you to summarize for our audience, you know, what makes Hexagon unique? You know, it's a company with a lot of different assets, a lot of history. Um, and I'm really curious how this is translated into what we're looking at today. Um, so we have a graphic here. Can you kind of walk us through um, what this all means and how Hexagon fits into this model? Yeah, it's it's a it's another great question, Aaron, and, and it's really one that I'm always happy to answer it because I think it shows a side of things that is really interesting, um, but that most people uh, don't often know. So, like, has been involved in aerial imaging for for a really long time. I think over a hundred years or something like that. And, and during that time, we've become quite good at building aerial imaging systems. But more importantly, as things evolved, uh, we came became very good at developing software solutions that that go with them. So, uh, as displayed in the graphic on the slide, we see that we as like a hexagon control the entire workflow from building and integrating the sensors uh, in our aircraft, planning the data collection, um, 
executing the missions based on the most stringent acquisition specifications, and finally processing the data with software designed to maximize the richness of the data sets. You know, this really allows us to maximize every bit of image radiometry and deliver the data with unparalleled spatial accuracies. Um, in that evolution, we've scaled the hardware and software together uh, to be extremely efficient and fast, which allows us to serve um, larger customers at the state level and even the federal level with our involvement in the in the NAEP program, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So, you know, this is a crank that we've been turning for quite some time. So we've become quite, quite efficient at it. And, and to go one step further, you know, we're really close to launching on the aerial side of Hexagon's HXDR pro, uh, platform, uh, the ability to, to take the sale of our data and the visualization of some of our data sets uh, to the next level. Uh, that's pretty impressive, especially that it goes back to, you know, nearly Wright Brother days. Um, and yeah, for those of you who um, aren't aware, um, so he threw in the name Leica there. Leica is part of Hexagon, that's correct? Yes, that's um, correct. So those p companies have, have merged over time and all of their resources are kind of under one roof, which is pretty impressive when you think about the going from aircraft to processing to then serving it up to all of um, your customers. So taking a step further here, let's talk about um, this content program that Hexagon has put together. Hopefully some of those on the call have heard about this before. If not, um, maybe you can give them a brief idea of what it is, how it came to be, and what customers are really getting when they subscribe to something like this. Yeah, um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds uh, here because this is something that we'll sort of talk about uh, through the the remainder of the of the presentation. But you know, Hexagon's content program is is just as it as it sounds, Aaron. This is a digital data repository that contains um, the entire continental U.S. Uh, coverage, parts of Canada and uh, Europe uh, as well. So you know, let's take a closer look at, at what we've actually uh, provide in in the Hexagon content program. So our our off the shelf products include. Uh, four band multispectral data um, for the majority at a one foot uh, statewide and six inch uh, urban uh, GSDs. Um, the majority of the data at this time uh, is one foot or 30 centimeter, but we're hopeful that during our next refresh cycle um, of, of acquiring states, we'll be able to transition uh, most of that to, to six inch uh, coverages. Uh, in addition to our imagery products, we also offer elevation data derived uh, from the imagery. So you get a really good core correspondence between you know the the optical uh, background of the of the 2d imagery as well as adding the third uh, dimension they're they're very closely aligned uh, because of our our photometrically uh, reconciled um, elevation data and so uh, you know as with all of our image data uh, this can be purchased directly through our online store um, for for really any AOI that, that you've specified or more importantly and, and what we're focused on today stream directly into a variety of GIS software uh, and custom applications applications via, via a WMS and, and WMTS uh, protocols. And, and we also offer hard pixel delivery uh, as well for, for some organizations that need that on-prem uh, data access. So, you know, our mature workflow has really produced the highest level of, of photogrammetric and radiometric quality, as I just discussed uh, in the last slide with our lineage of, of hardware and software. So um, this means that you know, we're providing um, single season coverage, uh, highly consistent data that's good for, for base mapping and visualization and even the most uh, machine learning and, and AI applications. The important thing to take away from from what we're talking about today is when you sign up for the content program, you get immediate access to the most current imagery for your state over a selected term. If we if we happen to fly your state within that term, you get that updated uh, data set as well. So, you know, taking a look at, at our backbone infrastructure and what makes it all happen, um, uh, Hexagon and our wonderful partners acquire uh, data um, at the state level and in a geography and cadence that is closely aligned with the NAEP program. So at any time we have access to 20 aircraft and a data processing center strategically distributed throughout the world, which really means 24 hours of, of uptime and processing. So in the US, after we process the data for NAEP um, and deliver it, uh, which is our first priority, we process the data at a higher resolution and add that to our current library holdings for access by our customers. Um, um, 
So, so to summarize uh, everything, uh, and as I alluded to earlier, the Hexagon content program currently contains 100% complete coverage of the US uh, with wide area coverage at just over 3 million square miles of 30 centimeter or one foot data and urban coverages at six inches, which cover about 200,000 square miles. Um, during this past flight season in 2021, uh, we added another 1 million square miles to those totals by refreshing uh, 16 states. Uh, and, and interestingly and importantly enough, you know, four of those states, Washington, Utah, North Dakota, and Delaware, joined Texas as being uh, complete six-inch uh, statewide wide coverages. Now, the flip side or, or the other side of the coin here is because this is a licensed product and a subscription-based service, uh, for the masses, not for, for individual states. Our, our baseline access does come with some standards that may make certain customers and organizations uh, less likely to join. And so this brings us to, to Content Plus and really the focal point of what we're, what we're discussing um, today. So you know, Content Plus allows our customers to evolve their relationship with us and their basic access uh, to the content data. As part of Content Plus, uh, organizations and customers have inputs on uh, refresh rates, resolution of the data uh, that we acquire and, and deliver to them, um, acquisition timing, uh, such as leaf off uh, collects, as well as uh, access to, to other data sets as well as it would be DSM or, or stereo data. Um, we provide flexible licensing terms, but we really find that most states um, are interested in, in increasing the frequency of collect, getting higher resolution data in their metro areas, um, or you know, as we've seen uh, recently, entire, entire states going with that that six inch statewide coverage. Wow, a lot to take in, but a lot of good information there about you know the content program in general, and then the Content Plus initiative on top of it. And that's kind of what we're going to be diving in today is exploring. Um, switching to a content model, what it kind of entails, what kind of questions you might be asking, and then how that Content Plus initiative was really created to address those concerns directly. So like, let's talk about streaming models for a moment and think about how this has actually kind of become the norm in so many other industries. I mean, we have um, software now that is licensed on an annual basis rather than going and buying a, a CD. We have um, kind of content in our, our daily life. Like I put this little graphic together for you all. Just think of one of how many of you are using at least uh, one of these that are appearing now, right? These are all examples of a content program rather than owning the data outright. You're buying access to a large library and then able to enjoy it um, you know, in, a, in your own home over the internet. You don't have to lug around the uh, the box of DVDs anymore, Travis. I think you had a kind of a nice example when it came to music for yourself. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I used to be uh, the type of person that when my my favorite music or album came out, I would rush out to a CD store. I, I know I'm kind of dating myself here, um, but I would rush out uh, to a music store and and buy that hard copy CD and bring it back home. And while I was listening to the music, I would sort of pour through the liner notes of the CD or the, or the album and and really understand, you know, how is the who wrote the songs, you know, who played that slide guitar on, on Teacher Children, um, or, or, or certain things like that. But you know, as I have evolved, I, I kind of moved away from, from that model. And it's really been um, a, a really positive uh, thing for me. It's allowed me to, to discover new music um, in a way that, that I never um, had before. I'm able to I take chances on albums now that I normally wouldn't shell out the fifteen or twenty dollars for. I'm able to share that data uh, or the the songs with with my friends to turn them onto music. So it's really sort of brought my my life a little bit, you know, further further mainstream with with everyone around me. For sure, and you know, obviously, there's difference between entertainment and a work product um, like imagery. But just kind of wrap your head around how our society at large now that the internet is. Um, really just kind of perpetual in our existence. Um, it enables, you know, instant access to a huge variety of um, information rather than us kind of to have assemble our own individual libraries. Um, and I mean, you know, a handful of firms out there have content programs, um, each kind of filling a specific niche in the world of imagery, whether it be aerial like Hexagon is doing or, or satellite or other specialized products. Um, but, the, you know, the reality is here, people can get nearly immediate access to imagery for their projects with nothing more than a login on a website. Um, and again, how, how nice is it to not have to 
uh, mail around physical hard drives anymore. Like I have one uh, right here, right um, in the past. That was the status quo. If you wanted imagery for your state, you had to process a whole bunch of uh, files, export them out, have them kind of organized in some uh, JS catalog type situation and, and maybe send them through with snail mail, right? So this has really changed um, that paradigm as far as I can see. Um, and I'd like to now draw your attention to a couple of our favorite examples, and those are some of the states that we've already seen um, start to make this switch. So here at AppGeo, we've had the good fortune of being able to work directly with some of the early adopter states. You know, those are those who we affectionately call the trailblazers. We see them blazing a trail into this new um, world of content. Um, so we've seen these programs evolve in Texas, Utah, as well as other states, and it's really flourished um, how they've been able to approach imagery, especially in sharing imagery um, within their state stakeholders. So, I mean, do you have any examples or surprising stories about how you've seen states leverage this type of program, um, how it's um, led to the betterment of, of their users, of, of their leadership, that kind of thing you wanted to share there? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've I've had the fortunate enough opportunity to uh, to be really involved with um, a content uh, program customer uh, up in the state of Washington. So Joanne Marker, Caleb Mackey, and, and Tony Olds um, are, are really sort of pushing the boundaries of of how they're using the data. Really widely shared. A variety of data products are being generated. So it's not just the ortho imagery uh, that they're using up in the state of Washington. Um, it's our stereo imagery um, and, and DSM data as well. And they've been able to generate forest stand metrics. Uh, they use it as base maps. They have a statewide rasterized hillshade model. Uh, they do ecological site indexing. Um, they work with the US Forest Service uh, and some other universities for fire monitoring. But, but what's really cool about the content program and, and working with AppGeo as well is we create this consistent data set year after year after year that allows uh, these change detection studies to right with with the introduction of Giza into this um, hexagon provides the most current data for a state but but Giza is able to take those those vintage data layers and, and provide offline access uh, for you know a variety of studies as well yeah thanks Travis um, we'll be getting into Giza a little bit more later on the presentation for those of you who that piqued your interest. Um, I wanted to kind of use the same opportunity to share what we've been um, doing with Texas through Tinris. You know, you mentioned all those different agencies that are able to tap into the content program up in Washington. It's very much the same story in Texas where we have all these different agencies and many more, um, all with different needs. And, you know, that makes kind of sharing sometimes tough, but with a content program, kind of everyone um, ideally can get what they want. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just the flip, flip of a switch, Aaron, right? We provide an access endpoint and you're, you're off and running with, with full, full coverage. And that assurance that you have the consistency year over year to dial up that older imagery and do change detection, you know, that has big implications within the scientific community, within um, planning and um, urban planning development, lots of really interesting uses. So what you're looking at here is the homepage of the Texas Imagery Service. And this is um, a state where they have, um, as you can see from the little description there, um, a Hexagon content program license with uh, the Content Plus uh, kind of initiative uh, in full swing. And what they are able to do is uh, provide imagery for all the users throughout the state. Um, we had a really nice interview with Gayla Mullins. You can see that interview um, in a video here on their homepage if you uh, want to check it out. But in, in that uh, webinar, we walk through just how this program works, um, how it's provided so many benefits for the users there, and how um, there's kind of a lot going on under the hood that makes it possible. Um, and as you can see here, here's a map of all the regions within Texas, just as an example, that have imagery available. All that light blue is 2020 data, and those um, other areas are even newer than that, like 2021. Um, so, you know, how many states out there can say that they're serving up that level of data across the entire state, that new? Um, that's all because of this content program. And I think they've been able to do it at a much lower cost than they would 
otherwise uh, would have realized with, you know, Texas being one of the largest states in the country by land area and population. Um, so now we've looked at a couple examples of states that have put these into action. We've gotten a little bit of idea of, you know, how the model works. But that being said, we still haven't seen the majority of states make the plunge um, into a content program. So let's talk through um, what we found to be some of the most common objections to making the switch. And being a company that has worked with probably nearly every state in the U.S. to some degree at this point, we've had a lot of time with our, our ears out to kind of understand the pulse of the leadership, uh, what's going on. You know, we're, we're at NISJIC every year and we're listening. And I, as I understand it, this Content Plus program really came about from listening to what states needed and modeling it after those specific concerns. So, uh, Travis, let's like walk through some of these objections and try to think about them from the perspective of our customers, maybe those people on the line right now, and talk about how Content Plus can help manage them after we get through. So, uh, the first I have here is licensing and the terms and public domain. You know, you're going from something you have complete ownership over ostensibly when you do a custom collect to something that is, is now licensed. So how can the imagery um, that they're now licensing will be used? And like, let's think about what they're actually getting in those terms. You know, absolutely. And, you know, to be honest, <clears throat> as, as most people know, a licensed product inherently has the restrictions, right? Um, Content Plus provides a stepping stone to give greater access um, and control than before. Um, but what really comes down to is, is cost and ease of access, which are the biggest positives uh, for most, and how you know a hexagon um, content program is able to answer the bell on, on organization specific needs or how we're able to reach a compromise if we can't satisfy you know a specific condition uh, completely. You know, so I would encourage those interested to take a look at the specifications and standards of the program. And, and I think you'll be surprised at how close they may be to your, to your own custom collection. So, so losing a bit of ownership there is, is probably not as, as big of a deal uh, as, as you think. And, you know, a, a couple of things that, that come up in, in licensing and in terms and in public domain is, you know, the public domain and access uh uh, question, right? So this comes up yeah. many times, right? And and we're we're happy enough to provide a downsampled version uh, of the imagery that can be uh, freely shared. So, for example, um, uh, six inch data can be resampled to a foot for for public sharing. So this this allows us uh, to protect our ability to resell the higher res data to others, but allows the state to meet their requirements around public access uh, to to imagery. And and in a lot of cases, um, this this even downsampled data is at a much higher resolution uh, than the, than the normally yeah, what they uh, had already. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and um, you know, there's, there's other things about sharing the data uh, that come up. And, and I think the content program, you know, works pretty well in this regard too. You know, we want to be able to allow people to, to share and, and access the data as widely as they can across, you know, the government, because that's, what we understand is how people get the full benefit uh, of of the data, right? So, our licensing terms are pretty generous in that regard. Uh, Aaron, you know, we allow uh, state and local stakeholders and government agencies to to access uh, the data, uh, and we also allow that data to be shared with any contractors who are performing work on behalf of those those government agencies. Now, there is one one caveat in there that I will uh, point out is, you know, we don't usually allow uh, federal agencies to participate participate in this, this distribution of data without an upgrade uh, to the pricing model. And this is really because, um, you know, they have more national uh, mandates and we, we feel it's unfair to, to subsidize those, those national uh, mandates at the, at the state, state level. And then, you know, finally, um, we're allowed, you're allowed to use the data on public facing websites as well, right? The only caveat that we put in there is uh, you don't have the ability to download a, a copy of the data and keep that in, in perpetuity. Absolutely. And I mean, I was privy to check out when the Utah spec was being put together and the list of organizations that specifically had access was probably the longest part of the, <laughs> the entire document, right? We had uh, state universities, um, local and, and state government offices, um, all sorts of different agencies that all had kind of equal access to this data as named users effectively. Um, 
pretty cool that just so many people are able to take advantage of this imagery. It's not being um, kind of hoarded away in, in one office. So um, it seems like a pretty generous offer there when it comes to, you know, not only being able to share the full version um, within all those internal users, but as Travis mentioned, that ability to have a downsampled product ready for download for the public is going to be great for all the people that um, would be, you know, hounding you for copies down the road. Um, and let's move on in the sake of time to our second um, biggest concern, and that is around the flexibility and timing of flights, right? Um, we have seen in so many states, there's different agencies that have different needs when it comes to, let's say, like leaf on and leaf off. For, for some groups, say you want to be doing a building footprint analysis or checking out impervious areas, well, for those instances, a leaf off collection is going to be great. But what if another agency is looking for a tree canopy assessment, right? <laughs> That's suddenly leaf on. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of other benefits to these too from, from all sorts of agricultural uh, perspectives and, and the list goes on. So can you tell us a little bit about how with Content Plus we can uh, maybe get the best of both worlds? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> Content Plus allows you to specify and have some input into the acquisition cadence uh, for your specific state, right? Um, during the term of, of your, your um, enrollment, uh, that data can be flown every year. One year it can be leaf off, the next year it can be leaf on, right? You can get uh, higher resolutions in certain areas, like a lot of states take advantage of, of higher resolution metro, metro data sets uh, to include on, on off years from when they're doing uh, state coverages. So it's really sort of a, a broad range of, of acquisition um, scenarios that we can handle. And you know we'll, we'll get to a sensor advancement later in, in this talk where we're, we're able to to increase our our ability and capabilities in, in leaf off uh, seasons as well. Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, just the ability to kind of define that, figure out what works for you, um, seems like a nice advantage. So moving on to number three, and that is the quality and accuracy. And, you know, us JS people are very data minded. And, you know, if anyone is to speak about accuracy, I think you have a good stake in the ground, right? Um, so, you know, is there a risk that going with the content program, you're going to get um, something that doesn't line up or is, isn't to the standards that you have defined? Um, with Hexagon, we don't believe that to be the case, but like, tell us um, why that is and how you're able to achieve um, the level of quality and the level of accuracy that, um, some of these states have come to require. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> this gets back to, you know, one of the first slides that we looked at in controlling the entire end-to-end -end workflow, right? Um, and as well as our, our lineage of, of providing imagery uh, on large scales uh, to various levels of programs. Like we understand that, that states want to have uh, control uh, in, in their imagery. Um, and, and I'll say, you know, after being involved in the industry for so long um, and being on both sides of the fence in terms of um, custom acquisitions from um, adjudicating them and selecting the right vendor to um, putting one out for, for other vendors to, to reply to, I can say that our standards are, are pretty closely aligned with, with what most states are ac asking for in terms of, of accuracy um, and, and consistency. And I think it's the latter one um, that is really the, the strength of our, of our data, right? We're flying uh, the same sensors over the same area year after year after year, which just provides a consistent product. And we're following all the, the standard photogrammetric routines, right? We're using um, a high level and number of ground control uh, in areas. Uh, we supplement this with um, uh, increased uh, point matching uh, during our workflows to, to extend that ground control to areas that are that are difficult to access. So, you know, the, the quality of, of our imagery in terms of spatial accuracy and consistency is, is really unparalleled. And, you know, the, the only thing I'll offer there is um, if you go to our website right now and you, you download our specifications for, uh, let's say, our, our ortho data, those, those specifications have to speak to our entire data holdings, right? So when we specify an accuracy for the content program, we have to specify an accuracy that's pretty conservative because it has to represent mm -hmm. the hardest space on in the in the country uh, to to image right so 
if you look and you think that those those data accuracies are a little bit higher than what you're used to or what you're expecting, you know, just just reach out and contact us. Uh, we can we can distill that down to the state level and give you a you know further detail on on what the spatial accuracy might be for for a more localized uh, uh, region. Very good. Um, I mean, having that uh, computing power behind the whole process, um, I think, is is really important. I've seen some of the work that goes into, um, you know, getting um, reducing shadows and fixing things like bridges that are traditionally tricky to get right. Um, there's there's a lot of proprietary processing going on behind the scenes that um, really deliver a very exceptional product from what I've seen. Yeah, and you know our production team uh, in Calgary that does north most of the North American processing has has really seen it all. So let's move on to our last one, which is honestly, I think the hardest thing of motivating anyone to make a change, right? And that's that we've we get comfortable in our routines, um, and um, we we don't want to switch because w from what works, right? Um, and in this case. Um, we'd like you to reach out to us and tell us, hey, what are your uh, reasons or hesitations? Maybe we can look at some of them in the Q&A. So, you know, feel free to reach out um, if there's anything else that we didn't cover. But, um, I mean, what can you say to those folks who have just kind of gotten used to having their uh, custom collect cycle? It's working for them so far. You know, what are the big motivators there that um, you would say to those people to get them to at least consider a switch. You know, I, I think it's, it, you know, from time to time, and I think this is true in our personal lives too, that I think it's important to get a, a bit retrospective and ask ourselves why we're doing things a, a certain way. And, and you know, if we if we draw those answers up on, on the whiteboard, if there's not really a concrete or d definitive answer to those, you know, maybe it's time to, to look into to other, other solutions, right? And, you know, the other thing that I'll encourage is as you're putting out that custom collect uh, RFP, include an option for content. I mean, what do you have to lose? there, right? Um, if you put out a custom acquisition uh, RFP that involves a content um, component to it, you'll be able to respond to that and you'll be able to see what we're able to provide uh, and the cost that we're able to do that at, which is probably um, in, in many instances less than a, a full custom um, acquisition, right? And this stems from the fact that once that data hits our ecosystem, we're able to resell that data. So we're able to, to acquire it um, at a much uh, cheaper price point than, than a, a custom application that's going to be you know, specifically limited to a, to a certain geographic area. But you know, that being said, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing from everyone one in the marketplace uh, on what they feel um, is most crucial for them and what's holding them back uh, the most, because this is the way that it leads to uh, additional options in the Content Plus program, that, you know, that we as administrators of the program and not direct users maybe haven't considered. So that's it's good for us to, to learn directly from the, the people that are out there using it, or, or perhaps a little slow to, to adopt it. For sure. And yes, please feel free to reach out in the questions. This is a great time to think about um, some of those as we move toward the um, last part of our program uh, before Q&A. So like, let's re just revisit all of these options again for a moment and compare what we've got here. Um, so it sounds like Content Plus was developed to overcome some of the objections that we just looked at um, and some of those objections that might have made a content program traditionally kind of a tougher sell for these government um, use cases um, that have uh, certain requirements in place. So in this next part of the presentation, I'm going to ask Travis to get into some of the more detail about how the program works and some of the underlying technology that makes it all possible. I think this might um, really open some eyes out there just to how advanced things have gotten and how they're able to provide the level of detail and level of quality they are at the price point that is being asked. Because I think technological advancements are really at the core of how all of this is working. And uh, if once you understand um, kind of the some of those assets that um, Hexion has under their wing, um, it's going to start making a little bit more sense. So um, just to kind of revisit the Content Plus initiative again really quickly, if you want to walk through, you know, exactly what that's giving 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is just a good summary of, of what we've been through uh, currently, right? So, you know, Content Plus really gives you that ability to 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 maintain or or get you know very close to to what your custom acquisition uh, has previously been, uh, right? We can't make sure that we're going to satisfy every requirement, but um, you'll you'll find that I think we'll get pretty close and at a much lower. Um, price point than, than a custom acquisition, right? We give you that public domain availability. Uh, you're able to easily share the data uh, amongst your uh, stakeholders really with immediate access, right? It's just uh, login credentials and you're, you're good to go. Um, we offer flexible payment options. So if a, a state wants to pool a bunch of a state organization, individual state organization money together to provide um, us to do um, the full statewide coverage or off your leaf off or higher spatial resolution acquisitions, we can do that well. And then, you know, in, in all of that, you, you enter our, our, our ecosystem and you're able to build relationships with, with us that are providing the, the data uh, to you. Excellent. I think this is um, a similar graphic here, but again, you know, that leaf off imagery, increased refresh schedule from what you might normally get, better resolution options, um, even more exciting data specifications. And then yeah, those flexible buy-ups for additional products uh, as there's some more and more interesting uh, type of uh, data collection going on. So on that note, like let's look at some of the sensors, some of the technology that's making this possible. So tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, I think if you just give it another click, Aaron, we'll see the full breadth of what we're talking about. Yeah, keep keep working through it. This is really like the most exciting uh, part of uh, of the content program. Um, looking behind the scenes here as as to what's uh, what's going on. So um, the the great thing about being involved in the content program is you're able to leverage all the advancements that we're making um, as part of what we sort of internally refer to as the innovation uh, ecosystem. We're constantly listening to the market uh, and potential customers to respond to shifting needs in um, user requirements of higher resolution and additional data products and improved acquisition tempos. So, you know, this included a shift of our data storage and distribution to the AWS platform in 2019. This allows us to take advantage of this tremendous platform, which is now widely available uh, to provide a cloud storage option that increases the stability of the data connection as well as increased speeds for data access uh, in, in usage, right? And so what we're seeing here is, is our content mapper, right? Um, an advancement in wide area imaging. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, so we've seen that as the needs of users grow, um, the strength of the mighty dollar remains unchanged, right? So we challenged our R&D team to not only improve acquisition efficiency, um, but as well provide the ability to provide more options um, on resolution in data products, right? So this led to the, the content mapper here, which is um, a large and wide area format uh, sensor that's designed specifically for the content uh, program. This thing is an absolute ortho rectification beast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it allows for increased flexibility in, in acquisition operations um, and really allows us for, for double the coverage at our current resolution, which means that we can fly higher and cover more ground or you know, double the resolution at the current flying heights, which are already pretty, pretty efficient from, from, our, from our acquisitions in the past. So this has a direct um, application to um, the ability to collect more leaf off data, right? Which are traditionally smaller windows uh, in the acquisition season yeah that is pretty impressive right double the fun <laughs> as they mm -hmm. say but if you think about it like if your bottleneck is how many days in the year you have to fly planes around by doubling the collection uh swath you're able to then provide twice the um coverage or twice the refresh rate depending on how you want to slice it so um pretty important stuff and that's not all folks because there's something else that Travis has to share with us today, and that is the Metro HD um, city data, which is kind of hot off the presses for the new year here. Yeah, this is something that that's really ex exciting, and it's been a, a really cool advancement uh, recently with us. Um, that was it was announced uh, last fall at Intergeo, and we're slowly sort of bringing it uh, online. So uh, the workhorse in the Metro HD program is our City Mapper Two sensor, which you see on the left side of the the slides there. So this is a follow-on from the City Mapper One sensor uh, that we developed in 2016. 
seen. So while the the concept may seem new, it's certainly not a new technology for, for us at Leica in, in Hexagon. So um, it's important to note this is a fully hybrid acquisition system, and it's not uh, traditional in nature where you've had one really strong sensor um, and a, an ancillary sensor that's just along for the ride. These are two world-class um, sensors integrated in one um, uh, platform, right? So this is um, our 150 megapixel um, MFC passive uh, imaging system and our two megahertz Hyperion 2, two uh, plus LiDAR system, which some of you may know is, is on our, our terrain uh, mapper sensor. So in looking at the, the bottom of the sensor here, uh, you see the, the LiDAR optic in the middle uh, of the of the unit. Um, we have two uh, Nadir cameras um, sort of uh, 45 degrees uh, from that, one that images in RGB, the other one in CIR. And then we have four oblique cameras uh, surrounding that at, at 45 uh, degrees. So uh, it gives you a full uh, sort of 360 degree view of, of the, the AOI that you're collecting. And this will be uh, its own initiative, uh, such that we'll be able to respond to customer needs and work for higher contracts, but it's also going to be a licensed a data product within the content uh, program. So again, you're able to, uh, to, to benefit from, from lower acquisition costs. So, you know, this is an option within content plus, um, as, as some states and organizations would get um, higher GSDs in metro areas, now Metro HD um, is becoming an option in those, those areas as well. And you can see the data sets that we can produce uh, on the right. So we can provide a standard orthorectified imagery, a true orthorectified imagery, um, LIDAR point cloud data, which is encoded with, with RGB information, DSM, DEM, an aerial mesh product, uh, the oblique data, as well, um, LOD two level buildings, which not only provide uh, foundation and height of the buildings, but also some information on, on roof structure. Um, and then we also provide a, a three-dimensional tree layer as well as part of that, that Metro HD stack. Wow, sounds like this does pretty much everything short of cooking you breakfast um, <laughs> and might be doing that next year too. Sure. Um, yeah, and I understand this is kind of on a world tour right now. Um, multiple cities are, are being collected in 2022. Um, in, in both Europe, Asia, and the Americas, and um, that's just slated to continue, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. We have some sample data that's coming online from some collects that we did uh, in the fall um, over New York City and also the, the Dallas metro area. Uh, so if you're interested, you know, you know, reach out to us and we'll, we'll get you a sample of what that data looks like. Very cool. So I want to go through these last topics pretty quick because I'd like to save lots of time for Q&A. We have many questions coming in. Really excited about that. Um, this is something you mentioned briefly earlier, but I think it's worth returning to, and that is simplifying procurement. You know, the RFP process is complex. It takes a lot of your time. How can moving to a content model simplify that or honestly just reduce some of the headaches? Yeah, you you hit the nail on the head there with, with the last piece of it, right? <laughs> we all know that RFPs are, are difficult to put out. They're time consuming. Um, we we take care of all of that for you, right? We take care of, of the, the planning, acquisition, and, and data processing. So you don't have to put that RFP out. You know, the other the other interesting piece that I don't think we've mentioned yet is you know, we take and and maintain all of the, the online storage capacity as well. So not only are we removing the headaches with the RFP. We're removing some of the IT infrastructure costs uh, and headaches as well. Is you know we're in the business to effectively and efficiently provide this at its most optimal uh, capacity, which which a lot of uh, organizations aren't aren't ready for. So right, you get to take advantage of of those um, those things as well. Excellent. And then um, in our last couple topics here, the end user experience. Um, we've talked a lot about kind of the high level of the purchase and the decision around, um, you know, getting onto one of these models. But what is it going to look like for the end user who's sitting down at their computer doing um, their work at the end of the day? Um, is it really going to shake up that experience in a, a positive way? Uh, absolutely, right? Ease of use. Um, it's really a seamless uh, thing, right? Once you're once you're hooked up uh, to the endpoint through your GIS software, it just it loads every time you go in there uh, and try to access uh, your GIS information, right? No slow loading of tiles, um, no um, 
the external um, drive is offline or somebody changed a path yeah. name, right? This is one, one easy uh, uh, access point uh, to integrate. Yeah, I mean, I think what we've been seeing is that more of these peripheral organizations are starting to take advantage because there isn't this massive data need and the learning curve is so much smaller, right? It's easy to click one button and then suddenly get into all these great imagery layers rather than having to necessarily be a GIS pro to get it all set up. Um, and then additionally, as you mentioned, that massive IT infrastructure backend is being managed for you as a service rather than you having to, um, you know, keep the servers from overheating in the closet, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, uh, it's a it's a win win. Um, and then, yeah, lastly, I'll just touch on um, kind of the cloud provider options. We've thrown a couple names around there, but this is a space that AppGeo is really committed to expertise in. You know, we are. Um, a premier Google partner and are really familiar with their cloud infrastructure, but also work with all the other cloud environments. So making that shift from storing imagery on site to into the cloud, obviously there's a cloud component to everything we're talking about here today. And that's kind of, I believe, where a partner like AppGeo can really help you make the switch because not solely just about um, the data at the end of the day, it's about your processes, it's about managing it. And to an extent, it's an IT um problem and we see all sorts of organizations making that transition to cloud managed services um so just kind of a reminder that we're here to help and i wanted to finish off just by a quick plug for our giza appliance we're gonna go into more detail on giza um in some later presentations this year and we have some great presentations in our library on it but um you know advances in tiling strategy have been at the core of the transition to you know moving into the cloud and as you have more and more imagery available to you suddenly it's kind of a big data problem to manage it and that's where giza can really help it's an in between uh, between your data like the great data that hexagon has and then your end users being able to provision um, individual links through wmts and then being able to manage all that data and kind of track it in in real time where that usage is occurring it's had some very um, eye-opening results for the states and users that have been putting it to the test. I mean, just like an example with uh, Texas again, who I keep bringing up, they've been using Giza for some time now, and it's able, it's allowed them to break out their usage between different agencies and create like a fair funding model where um, you know different groups are paying based on usage, um, which allows smaller agencies to get in at a lower cost and the bigger ones to kind of pay their share. But the end result is the whole state gets access to the great imagery um, by a shared funding model through Tinderous. Um, so you can learn more about that in, in our Tinderous presentation from uh, last year, but I thought I'd mention it as we uh, close things out for today. So, you know, lastly, making the switch or thinking about making the switch, I think uh, both FGO and Hexagon, we want to understand where you are in your cycle. We understand it's a multi-year process. You could have commitments going five years into the future already or be thinking about it now right and we want to invite you to explore what's possible with us and you know if you don't take our word for it talk to your neighbors who who have um made the switch see how it's working out for them understand you know what are their challenges and, and needs and how they may or may not be uh, getting met um and you know travis any last thoughts here before we start to close things out uh, you know, I'll, I'll just mention, you know, if you already have a relationship with someone at AppGeo or with Hexagon uh, sales team, you know, please reach out to them to start the conversation, right? <clears throat> uh, the journey, the journey, the long journey begins with one step, right? So uh, we're, we're, we're very open and willing to work with, with the organizations on any issue constraint or standard or requirement that you feel um, is, is pertinent. And then the last thing I'll mention, if you're, if you're still a bit undecided, go out to our webpage, Hexagon Content Program. They are able to sign up free of charge for a 10-day trial of our imagery streaming service. Um, this can be connected quite easily via any software that can handle WMS or WMTS protocols. So um, Global Mapper, ArcGIS, QGIS, a lot of CAD programs handle that as well. So uh, go out and uh, take it for a spin yourself. Absolutely. A test drive is always fun, right? Um, so just a quick... Um, update on our next webinar in the series. Travis has graciously agreed to come back and we're going to be talking more about that Metro HD program we briefly introduced, going into a lot more detail about what that includes. So if you're interested, be on the lookout for a email about us um, announcing that likely 
um, going to happen in March of this year. So with that, I want to kind of take it to questions. Thank you all for sticking around with us. I see we have a bunch of questions and we have a few minutes left, but I'm happy to stay on um, and hopefully Travis can stay with us for a few extra minutes to get to them all. Um, I want to make sure we cover all of these and without um, waiting around too much. Our first one actually came from Neil and <laughs> many of us know Neil. Um, would Hexagon consider um, a provision for Content Plus so this is, I, I think, about the six-inch imagery to be made available down the road. Um, so I know you talked about a down sample, but what about when it kind of ages out of, let's say, the newest um, year available? Is that something that we've been able to um, work with states? You know, I don't know if we've done that in the past. I'll 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 take a, a note of that and I'll bring it back to our our sales and um, and business development teams. They don't allow me to get too far into their uh, their swim lane, and I I try to keep them out of the technical side of things. Yeah. But it's certainly a possibility, right? If a new vintage um, is out there, um, then yeah, we we might be able to provide that. But that's something that we'd have to specifically work out in terms of a licensing agreement. And For stuff sure. Like that. And Neil had a couple follow up questions that I think are super pertinent to this discussion. Um, one is that they use a physical copy of the data for analysis um, in you know different applications that you feed it right in. And then their 911 system is completely cut off from the internet. So um, how do those use cases work with um, a content plus kind of model? Um, is there an opportunity to have a secondary physical copy? Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to receiving uh, the endpoint for, for streaming access, you also get a hard pixel delivery uh, via uh, drive, hard drive we can ship to you. Um, we have also worked with states where they're able to leverage some of our data directly from uh, the AWS uh, S3 bucket for, for download. So um, yes, there is the ability to get an offline copy and that comes at, at no charge uh, once you're enrolled in the program. Awesome. So um, thank you, Neil, for those great questions. I'm going to try to get through the rest of yours here in, in the few minutes that we have. Um, Carrie says that she's with a local government. Um, thanks for being here. Um, they've been working with pictom pictometry every three years for a flyover. They have a library that they go through with pictometry. And, you know, AppGeo's done a ton of work with pictometry. It's integrated into our, our MapGeo product. But she asked, how could we migrate to a content base like this? Would um, How would she kind of be an advocate for switching over to something like content plus for her area. Um, and, you know, obviously this is a ortho product straight down versus oblique. So, you know, are there some use cases where they can work together in tandem? Um, what are some of the ways that you think she could address, you know, the need for a product like uh, the, the content program in addition to what they've got now? And I really think this is where the beauty of <clears throat> the Hexagon and AppGeo relationship really uh, comes into to full view here, right? We're we're interested in providing immediate access to the most current data, but like I mentioned uh, in some of the other slides, AppGeo is able to take uh, some of that historical data that you owned and, and integrate it through their Giza platform. So you can keep the historical and vintage layers uh, in the Giza platform and then overlay on top of that the, the latest streamed content from from hexagon uh, as well and uh, in terms of the oblique uh, imagery yes we do have that as part of our of our city mapper 2 sensor and we've been discussing with a couple of states already um, oblique imaging uh, for for specific areas it's it's hard to do that on a statewide uh, area for us because it's something that that we're just uh, sort of getting our feet uh, wet on for now but if we know the specific use application we can always work with with customers to to get them what they need Absolutely. And I know we're coming up on the hour. So if any of you do have to jump, we thank you for being here. Um, and if you have any other questions, do feel to reach out to us um, and we'll we'll answer you by email. But I want to get through a couple of these other ones because uh, there's some interesting stuff here. Can the content be purchased directly from Hexagon and AppGeo and how do we negotiate the add-ons, um, someone asks. Yeah, you know, please reach out uh, to either myself or or Aaron, or like I said, if you have other contacts at, at Hexagon, yes, it can be purchased uh, directly. Um, just just give us a call and, and we'll see what we can do to, uh, to, to get you what you need. Awesome. Here's one from uh, Brandy in Montana. She says, Montana currently uses NAEP statewide. Some agencies have derived um, building footprints from LIDAR data. 
does Hexicon currently offer derived products? We certainly have certainly have the ability to provide uh, derived products. Uh, we have a mapping services uh, unit. Um, we tend in North America to work with uh, partners. There's a couple of partner organizations that we're really closely aligned with. Uh, you may have seen some uh, out in the in in the marketing on LinkedIn or whatever. So um, we work directly with partners to provide that. We don't you generally provide that ourselves, but we do uh, generate those those data layers for usage. Absolutely. And that's another area that um, AppGeo can help. And of course, having the best source data is going to give you the best results when it comes to any derivative uh, product. And our last question of the day, thank you for all of you who are taking the extra time to um, go into our bonus round here. (laughs) Um, This comes from Mary. She says, I work for a county government and we are scrutinized for how we spend public funds. Do we have to downsample hexagon imagery that is used as a base image on a county mapping site? So I assume that's one that is made available to the public. Or is it only for downloaded imagery? Um, And then she's, oh, she says, being in Colorado, um, what is one foot downsampled to? Uh, so yeah, so if it's a if it's a public facing website, um, then yeah, we'd have to talk through uh, how that is going to be specifically addressed uh, in the in the usage uh, agreement. If it's just part of of something that government employees have access to, no need to to download or down or sorry to downsample uh, that imagery. They they have access to it at the at the native resolution. Um, you know, it, to be honest, uh, Mary, I'm not exactly sure what one foot would be downsampled to that's something that we could specifically talk to right if you're looking for something that's that's better than nape i'm sure we could meet um meet you halfway there for sure so i think a good rule of thumb is if you've got a dot gov in your email address you're going to have access to the full resolution uh when you go to use the imagery right yeah and that brings up an important thing you know if you're if you're a county government talk with your your state gis organizations to to get involved right and if this works for you um start start discussing that this is important and this is maybe that's something that that they should take a look at for for all municipalities to have to access to the more you can pool this this money together the more options that you have uh, for us to provide you with with different products and services Excellent. Well, we've made it through all of our questions. So thank you again to our attendees here today. Thank you, Travis, for being a gracious guest. And um, we're really looking forward to having you back on in uh, just a couple months time for the next installment. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, we'll be making this recording available to you all. And we hope you have a great rest of your week on behalf of FGO.